This is Gina Gysi. It's a medical miracle that she's alive. Two years ago, she became the first person ever in history, without the protection of a vaccine, to survive rabies. Her regular doctor came in. His face turned white. And we just, we were done at that point. Yeah. Uh, we didn't know what to say. Rabies is a killer, one of our most ancient and deadly enemies. When doctors see these symptoms, there's nothing they can do. Rabies is 100% fatal, a death sentence. But Dr. Rodney Willoughby refused to watch Gina die. He broke all conventional wisdom and working against the clock, created a revolutionary treatment which brought her back from the dead. It was wonderful. And uh, I've never seen anything like it, but I hope to again. The question now is, was it a miracle or a cure? In the history of humanity, no one has survived rabies. Once the virus gets into the host body, it moves swiftly through the nervous system, hijacks the brain, and always kills the host. The viruses seem to have a strategy of either overwhelming shock and awe. When you have the dynamics of an animal that can directly inoculate virus into your brain, you have one very severe, overwhelming infection. As many as 100,000 people die of rabies every year, most of them in the developing world. The smallest bite, a single drop of saliva will kill. Children are very often the victims. Dr. Steve Sholand works in Southeast Asia battling this curse. When you look what rabies can do to someone, it's just absolutely devastating. And the deaths that they have are probably the worst deaths you can imagine. And when you see them suffer from rabies, you know, it just breaks your heart. So if you have clinical rabies, that's a death sentence. You're going to die. Modern medicine can save us from killers like smallpox, cholera, and typhoid. But despite centuries of searching, there still remains no cure for rabies. The age-old treatment remains unchanged. Isolate the victim, tie them down, and wait until the virus destroys them. Rabies is largely forgotten in the first world, but is making a dramatic comeback. These scientists are monitoring a new super strain of the virus in the bat population of America. Rabies has reached epidemic levels amongst wild animals, and every two minutes someone in the US has a close encounter with a rabid bat, skunk, or raccoon. In Europe, only Sweden and Norway are rabies-free, and in 2002, a man was killed by a rabid bat in Scotland. It was in the late summer of 2004, in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, in America's Midwest, that the remarkable story of Gina Gysi began. The 15-year-old was a typical girl next door, an A-grade student and star of the high school volleyball team. September the 12th was just another Sunday. It started as usual with mass, a short drive away across the small town at St. Patrick's Church. Two years later, still learning to walk and talk again, Gina Gysi comes back with her parents to remember what happened. It was this little black bat. It started, I think it came down from up there and it started flying around. It kept landing on the top of the windows, but never went out the open ones. Mm -hmm. And like then the like, it started, started to get lower. People started swinging at it with their hats. Apparently someone had hit it down, we didn't know that, but it was laying on the floor in the back and of course she's the big animal lover. And then I'm like, Mom, can I pick it up and take it outside? Because I wanted to help it, but I also thought it'd be kind of cool to pick up a little bat. So 
So I picked it up and I went outside and right as I was walking out the door, it bit me on the finger. I let go and it still hung on to my finger and that just really hurt. So I took it and I chucked it and I just walked away casually, just no big deal. Even now, the ingenious virus was invading Gina. Rabies is the only virus invisible to the immune system, hiding in the nerves and using them as an expressway to the brain. All mammals are prey to rabies, not just bats. The hallmark of rabies is the way it drives its host insane. Before it kills, rabies uses each victim to bite and infect the next. At the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta in America, where they coordinate the world fight against all epidemic diseases, Dr. Ruprecht is head of rabies research. Besides being one of the oldest infectious diseases, rabies has the highest case to fatality rate for any infectious disease. And so that's something we oftentimes need to clarify when we talk to individuals that when we're talking about a rabies case, we're by and large talking about a dead dog, a dead raccoon, or a dead person. There is a vaccine for rabies, but this woman did not get it in time. If there is a delay of more than 24 hours in getting inoculated after being bitten, if the first symptoms appear, then it's already too late. Nothing can save you. But John and Anne Giese knew nothing of this. When we looked at it, it was just Pin prick. a little. You know, nothing. Yeah, pinprick paper cut type. Bled, cleaned it out when we got home. Nothing to get nervous about. So we thought. So we thought, you know, yeah. yeah. The incident was soon forgotten. The Giesies had other things to think about. The coming of autumn plunges the town into football fever. The homecoming game marks the end of the season, a time of parties and dancing. So Gina didn't see a doctor. She was looking forward to Halloween. On Main Street, the windows were already filling with tricks and treats when Gina began to notice the first symptoms of what would be her own horror story. When 15-year-old Gina Giese was bitten by a bat, she never suspected that it might have rabies. A month later, she began to feel ill. Her parents didn't know it, but by now she had only days to live. Once rabies symptoms appear, not one unvaccinated victim has ever survived. Three weeks later, maybe, she started getting like a tingling in her arm. She couldn't even explain how it felt. It was just a real weird tingle. We're kind of trying to come up with things like, you know, pinched nerve or something. Never thought of that. Once Gina's arm began tingling, it meant the virus was on the move traveling along inside her nerves, headed for her spinal cord and brain. And about a week later, she started getting real tired and kind of flu-like symptoms. Her hand was starting to jerk a little. Her speech was getting a little slurred. If the person doesn't know they're infected or realizes the danger from that event, exposure to a rabid animal, when you start to present, you present with very vague non-specific flu-like signs. By the time you find out that it's something a little bit more severe than a head cold, the story's over and the person's become a statistic. This was what awaited Gina. But no one yet suspected rabies in First World America. In hospital, they ran tests. It was getting very scary. Yeah, but it was happening so fast, it wasn't like this was dragging out for, you know, weeks. This happened basically when she went into the hospital. She was gone over the weekend, so we thought it was serious, but never thought life or death. You, you just, you don't think that. Then, nearly a month after the bite, Gina began to get double vision. Her doctors started to test her for every disease they thought likely, but not rabies. I wanted to play in the volleyball game. It was the last one of the season. And we were playing against like our big rivals, so it was a big game. And we were warming up, and I was spiking the ball, like hitting it, and 
she would throw it up to me and I'd see two of them. I'd be like, which one's the real ball? So we went home and I don't remember anything after the game. Still in the dark, Gina's parents waited for the hospital to find something. We had no reason to think it was anything extremely serious because all the serious stuff that they were testing for was coming back negative. It was only then, after all other possibilities had been exhausted, that Gina's mother finally remembered the bat bite. Something made me tell him, you know, she was bit by a bat. His face turned white. Yeah. I'm not kidding. He looked, well, when did that happen? About a month ago? Well, you know, and he made me tell him the whole how it happened and all that. And uh, went over things again, her symptoms, and he says, I'll be right back. If it was rabies, Gina would progress to the disease's final and terminal stage in a matter of days. The local doctor realized he needed help. Now, when the textbook said it was already too late, Gina was referred to the intensive care unit at Children's Hospital in Milwaukee. The doctor on call, Dr. Rodney Willoughby, faced the deadliest virus known to man. The local physician had gotten a story about her handling a bat a month earlier. So I said, well, that means that we have to exclude rabies, and by the way, please hang up the phone now and tell your transport team to get into protective isolation, because if it is rabies, they'll all have to have shots otherwise. Just the suspicion that he had a rabies case sent Dr. Willoughby on a frantic, though he knew, hopeless search for a cure. He immediately sent samples of the spinal fluid to the Centers for Disease Control for confirmation. I think we consider rabies to be the Mount Everest. It's uniformly fatal, it's quickly fatal. People have tried forever to treat it and it's never worked. But if it was rabies, Willoughby knew he was out of his depth. He'd never even seen a case before, but he knew enough to be afraid. He needed to know if there was anything out there in the medical papers that might lead him to a possible treatment. Everything he read said there was no cure, nothing that ever worked. Gina was going to die. She had zero chance of survival. And I actually think the medical therapy, at least parts of what have been recommended, are harmful. Articles continue to recommend that rabies patients be uh, given sedation and that their pain be controlled. And so they're placed in darkened rooms, usually bound so that they cannot hurt themselves further, and sedated until nature takes its course, which is typically within a day or so. There are experts writing on how to care for rabies patients, but if it doesn't work, uh, there's no sense in reading those articles, and I actually didn't on purpose to save time. Most patients are dead in three to four days. A country like the U.S., the median time before somebody dies after they first experience symptoms of disease is about on the order of two weeks. Once rabies takes hold, the virus invades the victim's mind. They become the agent of the virus. They froth at the mouth and lurch from horrified awareness of what is happening to them to insanity and back again. Without a miracle, Willoughby knew this would be Gina's fate too. But then, working against the clock, Willoughby found an obscure paper on the internet which suggested the first glimmer of an idea. The author had discovered that while rabies patients die having violent fits and convulsions, their brains appear to be physically undamaged. This turned our understanding of the way rabies killed on its head. The idea was this, this remarkable uh, disparity between uh, a patient dying a violent death and a brain which is pristine at the moment of death. And that, that's what we seized upon in constructing what we did to treat Gina. From what Willoughby was reading, the virus seemed to hijack the brain, scrambling its messages causing havoc in the host body that led to the failure of all vital organs. It was the rabid brain that killed the patient. He began devising a radical treatment that might save a patient from their own brain. What was at stake here was more than Gina's life. In the developing world, tens of thousands of children and families are at risk. In Manila, capital of the Philippines, 
Packs of stray dogs living alongside the poor are carriers of rabies. Children playing in the streets are especially vulnerable. The only way to prevent rabies is to round up the dogs, vaccinate and neuter them. Teams of dog catchers see strays off the streets every morning, transporting them out of town. Owners face heavy fines if they pick them up after the animals have been neutered. But even these measures aren't enough to stem the tide of bite victims. While there are dogs on the street, there will always be some who develop rabies and all it takes is one bite. Dr. Steve Sholand is an infectious diseases specialist from Massachusetts. He spends every vacation in Manila. At home, he might see a rabies case once in his career. But here, working for the charity Rabies Free World, he is surrounded by the virus. It's the rainy season. The teeming streets and crowded slum areas provide a perfect breeding ground for this most deadly of diseases. Eight o'clock on a Tuesday morning in San Lazaro Hospital. Residents began arriving at dawn, having been bitten or scratched by pets or stray animals during the night. We're in the Animal Bite Treatment Center here at San Lazaro, and actually just yesterday they had 400 plus patients come down for treatment. Uh, you can see it's very busy, very crowded here. Uh, but basically what they're doing is people who might have been exposed to rabies come down, get evaluated. If they need treatment, it's given to them and their lives are essentially saved from rabies. This little girl comes in with her mother, her facial wounds still fresh. There are issues uh, playing with her, uh, her own dog and holding it by the, the muzzle, the mouth, and it didn't uh, like that and bit her in the face. Um, in terms of a rabies exposure, this is rather concerning because bites to the head and neck are more dangerous. She's got some uh, painful procedures coming up. At least she won't die from rabies. Those who come here are the lucky ones. Vaccinated within a day of being bitten, they should be saved the fate of the patients upstairs in the rabies ward. We're getting ready now to place an IV in our rabies patient. It's quite a coordinated effort. Death by rabies is agonizing. This patient is typical, a poor man from the slums who was bitten by his own dog. San Lazaro treats about 300 or 400 bite victims per day. And, and those are the people who are good, they're getting treatment. All these other people who are getting bitten and not uh, getting the appropriate care, they're ones who could be developing rabies. And then what do you do with those patients? Uh, these patients just come in and they're strapped down and they die. And they die quite horribly as well. I mean, to die from rabies is, is awful. Willoughby's quest for a cure has implications for rabies sufferers the world over. But in Wisconsin, he couldn't do anything until he had official confirmation from the Centers for Disease Control, where he had sent her spinal tap samples, that Gina actually had rabies. This sure looked like rabies to me. Gina was getting considerably worse. She was salivating a great deal, which is again part of rabies, requiring her to be placed on a breathing machine. Then she was fighting it so bad, her, her everything, the alarms were going off. I'm sitting over in the corner. He wasn't there. No. Um, just going nuts, like what is going on? You, you, you just feel so helpless. I was never so scared in my life, seeing your child laying in bed. You know, that's sick. Dr. Willoughby said the uh, CDC confirmed that it was rabies. And we just, we were done at that point. Willoughby knew Gina had only hours left to live and threw himself into one last effort to create the cure that had eluded science for centuries. He already suspected that the key was the way rabies killed, hijacking the brain and scrambling its signals sending the body haywire. His breakthrough was to realize that if he could shut down the brain, he could stop the virus in its tracks. 
take Gina's brain offline, and perhaps he could buy her immune system time to rid her body of the virus. He'd put her into the deepest of comas, denying Rabies the chance to kill Gina by effectively killing her himself. And we noticed what looked like this huge hole in the defense of rabies that no one had tried. Just sedating the brain to the point where it couldn't function long enough for an immune system to finish the job off seemed obvious. And that was sort of the eureka moment. And so the plan was stitched together in half an hour. And the other half an hour was debating vigorously whether we should even mention it to the family. They, uh, pretty much accepted the idea that Gina would die as a fact, a medical fact, um, and, but at the same time offered Gina in the sense so that we could figure out if this in fact had any promise at all for the next family. And it was uh, uh, probably the most altruistic uh, uh, decision I've ever encountered in 20 years in medicine. You, you can't just say, well, no, let's not. Let's let her die in peace. No, you gotta, yeah. you gotta try something. There's gotta be a first. I said, whether it's cancer or some disease, whatever it is, there has to be a first. And Gina's gonna be the one that walks away. And from that point in time, it, I, I, I guess I reached down in my, myself and I, I clinged on to whatever faith, you know, I could get and I, I started believing that. It was sort of a far out idea, but hey, we had nothing else to lose. The things that were tried and true resulted in failure before. I haven't uh, seen 100 patients die of this. I've, I've never seen anybody with rabies before this case. So ignorance is bliss. And you know, we're can do. We're Americans, I guess. Maybe I should have had more doubts. But we'd never make, it, make any progress unless people basically went after the hard stuff. So Willoughby went ahead with his experimental protocol, unheard of in the treatment of rabies. On October the 10th, Gina was put into a coma so profound she was only a hair's breadth from death itself. This is dangerous even for a few hours, but Willoughby planned to keep Gina under for as long as it took. They we're trying to buy time for the immune system to catch up. So the immune system takes about five, seven days to start an antibody response and about 10 days to have it be vigorous. And we think that that antibody response is important for the clearance of rabies from somebody's brain. The worries were that as you push someone to sedation, it's a fine line between sedating the heart, for example, and sedating uh, the brain. And so we were worried that we'd push too hard and her heart would fail. We were ready to pull the plug if things were bad because it's dangerous stuff. But even if Willoughby's untried treatment didn't kill Gina, was it actually doing anything to help her fight the virus? Had this procedure brought her immune system the time to mobilize and fight back? All he and Gina's parents could do was watch and wait and hope the virus wasn't killing her quietly as she slept. When Gina Giese was infected with rabies from a bat bite, her doctor, Rodney Willoughby, knew the textbook said that she would die, but he refused to give up on her. In a few hours, he developed a radical treatment which might buy Gina's immune system time to fight the virus. She'd been in a chemically induced coma, perilously close to death, for six days. You know, we had no idea what we were doing, so, you know, you of course, worrying that, you could, uh, that it's not going to work and you're worrying that it's going to um, harm the patient. We were expecting rock and roll and nothing was happening. And that was six days to think about what's coming up and whether we're going to have a total disaster or a dead patient or whether this is going to work. That's six long days. While Gina's life hung in the balance, her mother kept a diary of her feelings. Dad, Jonathan, Matt, and BJ came up. It was the first time they had seen you since the sa last Saturday you were home. It really hurt for me to see them because I knew how much they were hurting. I had a hard time seeing them cry. They told you 
to get better. And they said they love you. Jonathan said to get better so you can make fun of him for crying. That's about it, sorry. <laughs> After seven days at the very edge of death, came the first signs that Gina's immune system was making antibodies to fight for her life. It seemed Willoughby had pulled her back from the brink, but what he didn't know was what damage the virus, or he himself, had already done to her. Our great fear was that we would end up with a person so heavily damaged that they wouldn't be able to move or do anything, or even worse, what we call a lock-in, where someone's there cognitively but has no muscle function and can hear and see but can't speak or swallow or do anything else. When we took her out of coma and she didn't move and she didn't respond to pain, and I thought we'd basically created a, a very vigorous vegetable, and that, that was the worst day of my life. Willoughby's nightmare was that he had saved Gina's life, only to condemn her to a living death. Trapped forever in her own mind, came a tantalizing breakthrough. Gina moved. Ten days after he started his revolutionary treatment, she opened her eyes. But was Gina in there? Or was this just random muscle activity? And the only way I could figure out to, to measure that was to present her with something which is wired in very early, such as your mother's face. He said, you know, maybe she would rather see our faces than these masks, you know, maybe she's just afraid. And so he said, why don't we take them off? If her eyes trapped her mother, then Gina was fighting her way back. This was the moment of truth. and her eyes stayed open. It was just like, wow. <laughs> she knew who she was. Yeah. She knew who Anne was, and that was, yeah. that was huge. I don't know. She's there. You know, look at your mom. Well, obviously right. she knows then who I am. We yeah. felt that she was, that she made it. Rabies unwires you completely, and it, it appears now it takes you at least two years to fully rewire. The, uh, the plug had been pulled, and then the, you get plugged back in again. And so as you come back, uh, you have to learn all over again. When I woke up from the coma, I couldn't talk. I didn't have any noise. Like, my mom and my friend, they said, like, when they would, like, clean my teeth, I'd like scream, but I wouldn't make sound. My mouth would just be open. You could tell I was screaming and tears were coming out, but I wasn't making sound, which is kind of weird. It's kind of freaky. She would try to scream, but with no voice, nothing would come out. And it was, that was scary. You knew how much pain she was in. I went through therapy. And that just hurt because my muscles were so tight, like it hurt to move. As her voice came back, we were able to understand more words and communication was, was big. Once we were able to talk back and forth, that really helped. Dirty head. Did make dirty come together more. Dirty head. Gina was the first rabies survivor. She'd come back from the dead in a blaze of publicity. But she had paid a terrible price for her life. 
when she first came out of the hospital, we wheeled her through the doors. I don't, it's probably a bad term, but she, she was a basket case. I mean, she had, her emotions were all messed up. Uh, she was stricken to a wheelchair. She was barely talking. We got her home, uh, got her on the couch, and we tried to come up with, okay, now what do we do? How are we going to get her from point A to point B? She started crawling uh, pretty much early on, and then pretty soon she made her first couple steps again. She was able to stand up. She'd take her first step, just like having a, a, a baby again. What made it bearable is that every day she accomplished something new. You smile. You look at her when she's doing something, whether it's anything. If she's yelling at you or having <laughs> one, of her, one of her tizzy fits or beating on her brother or whatever she's doing, you smile. It changes everything. It, it makes your life, uh, it, it changes it. It's really hard to explain. You know what it's like when you have a newborn baby, you look and you know your life has changed. We've had this twice with one person. A year after leaving hospital, Gina was rediscovering her love of riding and combining it with physiotherapy. When I first get on the horse, it's kind of hard. Like sometimes my left arm just doesn't want to pull me up and I kind of sit there. But once I'm up, I'm fine. <laughs> I miss this. Being in the saddle gave her back a sense of balance and confidence. Her recovery was remarkable, but her father still clings to a memory of the Gina he lost and may never regain. Gina's... Hey, this is Gina Stahl. I can't answer right now, so leave a message. Hi, Gina. I love you. Um, her, her message is from before the, she was bit. And um, she never changed it. She never updated it. So her voice, the way she used to be, is on there. And um, it's kind of special. I don't want to say I go back to, to remind me how she was because I'm, I'm extremely happy with what we have now. I've always had a hard time looking at the old family videos and stuff like that. There's too many what ifs. It's a little hard to go back and look at certain things. To listen to her voice on the phone and to hear her in person, it's the best of both worlds because if, if she would have died, this would have been all I had. This would have been it. This would have been the last thing we would have had. For the Giese family, the nightmare was over. Dr. Willoughby faced a new challenge, convincing the medical community that her recovery was more than a fluke. He thought he had invented a cure, but to prove it, he had to get the protocol repeated. So Willoughby decided to publish the protocol on the web where any doctor could use it. I put the protocol up on the web because we think this can be done again. And this is one of the world's most awful diseases. And uh, all we need is one or two more patients. And this is a proven medical treatment. And this is a simple story that's gotten a lot of media attention. Uh, By now, the word was out. At a major international news conference, Willoughby, who wasn't a rabies specialist and had only seen one case, was about to tell the world's experts on rabies that he had succeeded where they had failed. Perhaps not surprisingly, the reaction was decidedly mixed. Willoughby had a fight on his hands. It remains doubtful uh, whether she made her recovery by her own. What about the use of therapeutic coma? There's really no basic scientific support of, of that hypothesis Rabies seems to kill people pretty regularly. I'm a little puzzled by this um, attempt to want to explain this away. I think you have to prove us wrong. And I think uh, the idea is that this is medically and scientifically as sound, and we have one to your zero. While the critics argued that Willoughby's protocol should be stopped in its tracks, for others, like Dr. Sholand in the Philippines, the possibility that the protocol might work brought hope to a world where before there was none. Well, I think the protocol is genius, and, and no one even approached the treatment of rabies in this way, of letting the immune system wake up, do its job, and take care of the infection. 
You know, that's what immune systems are supposed to do. And then here, Dr. Willoughby and his group developed this protocol, and it actually worked. You know, maybe it's not going to be 100%, but, you know, if it's 50%, I'll take that. One patient lives, one patient dies. Hey, you know, if I can offer someone hope, I'm going to do that. The chance of duplicating the Milwaukee Protocol in Manila has resulted in a massive effort to beg or borrow equipment from American hospitals and build this, a new rabies facility from which, one day, patients may walk out alive. So here we have room number 13, which is going to be our rabies room. Gina was just one case, but when you look at the theory behind the protocol, it seems to make sense that it could actually work. And I think with rabies, given that it's such a devastating disease, you know, why not? You know, why not try something that uh, could really work? You know, there's so many patients coming in here to Sam Lazaro, I feel you've got nothing to lose. I've been lucky enough to actually meet Gina. You know, you could see her, you could touch her. It was like doubting Thomas, you know, you could actually believe. So whether the uh, treatment protocol actually worked or whether a miracle occurred, nobody really knows. But I also believe that science can work miracles. Without big money behind him, Sholand, like so many battling rabies, has little chance of being the first to save a second patient. Things looked bleak for the radical new procedure, when suddenly there came news from an unexpected quarter. In Thailand, one of Dr. Willoughby's main detractors, Dr. Hema Tudor, had admitted a young patient with the first symptoms of rabies. We trying to follow exactly the protocol, and then this is life and death. Although I, I'm, I'm, I'm not believe, I do not believe much in the in the protocol. But if it saves life, so this is this matters the most. The second person to undergo the radical new procedure that had saved Gina, known as Mr. B, had come to Bangkok to earn money to pay for his wedding. Like many Thais, he had adopted a puppy from the street. The dog became infected with rabies, and when it nipped Mr. B, tragically so was he. Mr. B did not go to the doctor for a rabies shot because he thought it would cost him all of the money he was saving for his wedding. In fact, the vaccine is free. Before receiving the, the coma induction therapy, uh, he uh, talked to his uh, sisters talked to his mother for about five, ten minutes, and then uh, he realized that, okay, he, he would die. Like Gina's family, Mr. B's relatives could only wait and hope that the radical procedure from America would save their son. Once Dr. Hema Tudor and his team had put Mr. B into a deep coma, they began to test his spinal fluid to see if he was producing antibodies to fight the rabies. Gina's immune system was making them from day one. But multiple testing showed that Mr. B had none. We could not demonstrate any antibody at all in the serum as well as in the CSF. And uh, this may be regarded as bad news the rabies virus are in the hair follicles and uh, in the saliva specimens. Uh, that is, the virus remains inside the body. We hope that by the end of the first week of treatment, we can uh, see the antibody response in the serum as well as the CSF. And uh, then if we can save the end organs, uh, the lungs and the kidney, as well as the liver, then the patients may have a chance to survive. As Mr. B lay in the near-death coma, the doctors carried on testing for signs of a fight back from his immune system, knowing the survival of only the second rabies victim in history would spell success for the Milwaukee Protocol. In Bangkok, it's day seven of Mr. B's fight against rabies. The doctors are worried. Their patient's immune system is still not responding as Gina's did. He's not making rabies antibodies. In the depths of coma, 
Gina's immune system woke up and fought back. His has not. Tests show the rabies is now multiplying at a furious rate. Mr. B's saliva is filled with virus, and his organs are now failing. He's developing some complications of the lungs, and then uh, today, uh, this is day seven after the treatment, we start having problems with the kidney failure. Within 24 hours, riddled with rabies, Mr. B's heart has finally given out. He is pronounced dead. The protocol has failed. For the family, there is nothing but grief. For the doctors, there are hard lessons to be learned. I do not recommend this protocol to be applied again until we know exactly what has been going on. This protocol may be preserved just only in the cases who have the antibody appear on the first day and show up at the very beginning of the disease course. You think I should be depressed and demoralized by this, but um, I, um, the theory holds. Uh, it holds with a substantial amount of uh, laboratory underpinning now in terms of the literature and experiments we've done. And so um, I, I'm, I'm really sure we're right. And uh, if we can just get a break, and the nice thing is for this is that if we get one survivor more or two, uh, we're done. This isn't going to take uh, 10,000 or 100,000 people to prove this. Uh, we just have to, to use baseball analogy, we can connect the bat once and knock it out. We're done. When you see the patients, when you see the families suffering, how can you give up? You're talking about, you know, a handful of attempts. You know, for, for, for any great discovery, to get it right on the first go, why give up after it's really been tested? I don't believe that it's actually been given the full trial that it that it needs to be before you can say this doesn't work forget it go back to your old way of treating rabies patients just let them die comfortably i mean gina had a chance and her life is saved now what about these other patients shouldn't we try to be saving them also while the world of medicine debates willoughby's procedure the girl whose battle with rabies left her unable to walk or talk has passed a significant test of physical coordination. Learning how to walk and talk and pretty much do everything needed to do in life, that was a big step. But I think people who come up to me and say, are you driving? I say yes. They say, wow, you know, they can't believe it. So I think it's a pretty big step. I am kind of bitter. I was ready to play senior volleyball, you know, it was really big. And now that I can, I guess I'm kind of pissed off, but, you know, it's kind of something that you have to deal with. At the point where rabies interrupted her life, Gina was looking forward to the annual homecoming ball. Tonight, two years on, she's going to make up for lost time. To me, she looks the same as she did before the rabies. To see her this way again is its just amazing that she's come so far. I'm excited about the dance tonight, but I'm also nervous because it's been, I haven't been to a dance since my freshman year. So it's going to be kind of different, kind of remembering how everything goes. I think it's kind of cool because the first dance that I go back to is actually in my senior year. So it's kind of like, it's like a big accomplishment. Hey! Whoa. You look really nice, Eric. He's really happy. For the past two days. These actually say my name, Gina, and then on the other side they say miracles happen. And my best friend, uh, she made them for me. 
<laughs> right in the eyes. Your soup's getting cold. Let's go. Okay. Have, Have a good time. Bye. You guys should be prepared. See you guys. Careful. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Seatbelts. Seatbelts. There were some sad times in there. You know, wondering what's going to happen and she's going to make it. And to see her, you know, leave now, smile on her face and happy, you know, it's, it's really special. At the Children's Hospital, another homecoming. In the intensive care unit where they made medical history, the teenager is still part of the family. Well, that's wonderful. You know, I, we, we all practice medicine. I think rarely do we actually save a life, clearly and succinctly, and, and uh, she's mine. So I'm delighted, and uh, even if it's a miracle, I'm delighted. I will always be the first person to survive rabies, and if it works on a second person, it's going to start like a whole chain reaction of people surviving rabies. Next, two different worlds, five different lives collide in Bangkok. From the creator of Cold Feet comes Tripping Over, original new drama from Five coming up for your Monday.